the text basically hasn't changed. Uh, that's true. He has four copies made of the text, and those differ a little bit from one another. And those differences um, are probably just a result of scribal mistakes. Uh, the differences that are there are really tiny. It's, you know, one says, and he said, and the other one, a verse just starts with he said, and and. So that's one thing you get. You get, you know, a text that is somewhat different in these different regions, but very tiny. I mean, it's a very, very small number. So we're, when we're talking about it, um, we're talking about about 40 differences, maybe a tiny bit more. Um, and those are the differences between the texts. And after that, um, the text has been copied meticulously. And even those four, your first four copies are very meticulously copied. And basically, um, the text as we have it today is more or less the same as the way that Rahman has standardized it. Um, more or less, I say, uh, there's some spelling differences. So some words change spelling over time, um, but you know they change spelling over time. It's a small, small spelling difference. What you don't get is, say, inherited changes. So after these these first four copies, which you have some spelling differences, which seem to be inherited by all the manuscripts that come after, if you see some kind of change happening in the manuscript, we don't see that spread into other manuscripts. So really, you know, from 650, that's more or less when the text was fixed, and People don't really touch it anymore. You know, you don't get added verses. You don't get added suras or or, or changed verses or these kinds of things. Basically, uh, it, it's quite stable. الذين يبخلون ويأمرون الناس بالبخل ومن يتولى فإن الله هو الغني الحميد هو هو in medieval works, we have many reports of small differences between Qurans that they find in Medina, Kufa, Basra, and Damascus. Uh, and we indeed find these in early manuscripts. So, for example, it is reported that in Medina and Damascus there's Fa'in Allah al Ghani al Hamid, uh, while Kufa and Basra is Fa'in Allah Hu al Ghani al Hamid. And indeed, that's exactly what we find. Here the Hua is missing, here the Hua is present. Two different manuscripts with two different spellings. Hadani. Surah Taha, where the text, this gets a bit, uh, a, a bit technical, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it anyway. We get Inna Hadani La Sahirani, which is uh, these are not but, um, but two uh, sorcerers, and the word these two, Hadani, should have been from a classical Arabic grammatical point of view, should have been Hadani. And with a yeah in the middle, which you would write differently, which would change the text. Uh, so it looks like a grammatical error. 
Um, and it's been called a grammatical error in the tradition. It's really interesting. So it's a, code, it's a codified grammatical error. Yes, actually, you have looked at this and like, no, look, this is, in some dialects, you can say it like this and there's other solutions and, and there's all kinds of ways to do it. Um, but one of the canonical readers, Abu Amr, who was also a grammarian, and that probably says something about why he went for this reading, he fixed the reading. He's like, no, no, this is clearly ungrammatical. So he ignores that lesson, goes with what he thinks is grammatically correct, and that's what we have in his recitation. وَالْمُؤْتُونَ <تصفيق> إن الذين آمنوا والذين هادوا والصابئون والنصارى من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر وعمل صالحا فلا خوف عليهم فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون والصابئون 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 We have like traditions from from Aisha saying, uh, so that's the wife of the prophet, right. saying no, these are mistakes in the in the mushaf, these are mistakes in the codex. Uh, just matter of fact, and it's like okay, because we need to go back to Aisha, who knows? But someone quite early on was spreading this tradition. Clearly, he thought it was less of a problem to say there were grammatical errors in the text than right. having a grammatical error in in Revelation, right? That that's where it comes down. They do that every now and then. They deviate from the text, not always to 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 fix grammatical mistakes. Every now and then they will have a variant which is found in other regional codices. So, the, so um, uh, Hafsdas is a, uh, two times, two times, I think so, where the Kufan Codex doesn't have the reading he has, but the Basran one does. So apparently he was aware of the Basran Codex. He was like, well, you know, that's also Quran, so I can do this. So I can permit myself to, to read this differently from the text because I think the text has it that I have is a bit ugly or something like that. So he, he felt free to do that. So that's a very typical thing. All these different uh, copies, they are actually, it is one copy, it is one Qur'an, but they are copied uh, by, they were copied and sent, you know, to these different um, uh, cities. However, there are some differences in them. Uh, now, in the tradition, these differences became part of the Qira'ah, became part of the, um, of the variant reading. So you would have in one, let's say in the Meccan Codex, you would have uh, a preposition which is dropped, you know, a min, let's say, which is dropped from the, uh, from the verse. And then this becomes a Qira'ah. 
that you know for a certain for a wisdom that we are not aware of they chose to drop this man uh, from the Meccan codex um, that being said there are of course other Muslim scholars who said no they were scribal errors Ibn Khaldun for example if you read in his Muqaddimah he tells you that the different the textual differences we have uh, in these codices are scribal errors you can't just attribute them to you know divine revelation especially that when these you know, textual uh, differences between the codices are obvious scribal mistakes. Wow, fa, min, propositions, uh, alifs, you know, all these things that when people are copying, they were, you know, they, they uh, naturally, you know, drop or add. Uh, however, these textual differences, the prepositions, the conjunctions, um, uh, they became part of the Qira. So if you, uh, up un until today, so you listen, you know, to, a, um, you know, the Meccan reading, let's say in Surah At-Tawbah, Jannat and Tajri, Tahtaha Al-Anhar, and then you have Jannat and Tajri, Min Tahtiha Al-Anhar, you, you listen to, uh, you know, the Meccan reading, or even you know, you open the Meccan Codex and you open any of the other six, you know, codices uh, or listen to them. And then you would find a min here and then you will not find a min there. And it still exists today in, um, in our recitation. Some of these variants that we're talking about um, have an effect on the whole text. So, for example, uh, and this is no, no linguistic meaning, it has no meaning in terms of uh, meaning of the text. Uh, but it has an effect on how it's recited, which is a very important part of this text. So as an example, if you take the word uh, upon them, uh, in most reading traditions, that's pronounced as alayhim, but in one reading, it's pronounced alayhum, and in another one, it's pronounced alayhimu, or two other ones, actually, within the canonical transmissions. Uh, the word na'matullah is this phrase, it means the grace of God. And this first word, na'ma, um, can be either written with one letter or the other. Uh, so ta and ha, uh, those are the two spellings that you can write it. What's interesting about this, we find this in the Quran, we find both of these spellings. And this phrase, na'matullah, or na'ma rabbika, and these kinds of things, uh, which means uh, not um, the grace of God, but the grace of your Lord, but these kinds of things. Uh, so this, this kind of construction occurs 23 times in the Quran. And in the modern print editions, it's spelled one way 11 times and the other way 12 times. So basically 50-50, right? It's an uneven number, so you can't actually go 50-50, yeah. but it's 50-50. It looks like it was completely up to, up to the scribe to do whatever they wanted. The thing is, it wasn't up to the scribes. It was up to the scribes who first wrote the Uthmanic text. They just wrote, and they apparently were like, well, I'll write it this, time, uh, this way this time, and I'll write it that way the other time. And... After that, that became absolutely fixed as if holy. You could not start changing those spellings. Every now and then people go, you know, the, the text we have today is 100% the same thing as the Uthmanic text. That's wrong. That's not true. There's hundreds of places where the spelling has changed over time. A couple of examples here, and this is this is typical. Um, so what we get here is is a verb, qala, which means he said, which may also be read as qul, uh, which means say. Mm. And, um, well, as you can see in these translations, which I quite like, is they, they, they found a way to get around that, right? Either the Prophet said, or um, say, O oh, Muhammad, uh, and basically you're doing the same thing, right? It means exactly the same thing. The thing is, this is a place where the text is ambiguous. So in the earliest manuscripts, um, whenever you write qala, which means he said, you read exactly the same as qul. They're indistinguishable from each other. And as a result, you see that one reader, if, if both readings make sense, I mean, the vast majority of the time, only qala makes sense. Uh, and you're like, okay, well, there's no doubt that it just means he said. And uh, a vast majority of times, uh, qul only makes sense, say. Uh, but every now and then, you come in a, in a context, you're like, well, I guess both readings would work. And both readings come to be. Uh, and then you indeed end up 
with half reading qala and and what reading qul and that's basically basically what what is happening it seems to be an in interpretational thing um uh, and muslims would often say yeah no both of these versions were revealed um but it's clearly stemming from a ambiguity in the text where that ambiguity in text wasn't there when it was being said or you know being you know, whispered into the ear it's there because the scripts cannot distinguish these two words this happens with, with the readings every now and then it's you're like well obviously this reading is being being generated by the text and they are looking at the text and like okay i could read this in two ways both of them make good sense to me and one person came to a different conclusion than the other and um and every now and then you're like well these words are nothing alike um <laughs> But they are spelled exactly the same because of the amb ambiguities of, of, of the scripts. So um, a famous one is you get um, um, which uh, are you know, words that are just completely dotted differently, but the dots aren't there. So they sound different, they're very different words, but you could read them both written down. Clearly, the, the written form is what's primary here, not the pronounced form. And um, since there was no written form of the text when the revelation was supposed to happen, th these can't both be revelation in that sense. Another thing is some spellings start moving towards what becomes a classical Arabic spelling. So the spelling of the Quran is a bit different from what becomes classical Arabic spelling. And some of it starts moving towards that. Um, so another example would be Dhu, which means the one of, like in Dhul Qarnayn. Um, that used to be spelled with three letters, Dhal, Wow, Alif. And in the modern text that we have today, that alif has been um, removed. Before it was amb ambiguous, because before it clearly was the wa, and that means uh, the two of the two horns, which is probably doesn't make sense there, but in some places it, it, you could actually get an ambiguous reading there. So that fixed it. What people very often say with the readings, like, well, they're just dialects. Well, they're not. They really are not. We have very good descriptions from medieval grammarians who say, this tribe says it like this and this and this and this other tribe does it that way that way and that way and that way and not a single one of the canonical readers follows any of those patterns so we actually have a good idea what for example the dialect of hijaz so that's the region where where uh, muhammad had his prophecy basically um nothing looks like that dialect over there. They are all mixed with all kinds of different things. So every now and then you get a form and that's, you know, typically Hijazi. And then you get another thing that is typically non Hijazi and they both show up sometimes even within a single word. If you would follow, follow the descriptions of the grammarians, you're like, well, I could read this word in like these five different ways. In this dialect, you would read it like this. In this dialect, you'd read it like this. In this dialect, you'd read it like this. And not a single one is the actual pronunciation that we have in the Quran. Um, so it's, it's being mixed from all kinds of different places. Now, the question is, to what extent is that being mixed? Is that part of the, say, the performance register that kind of develops over time, which is what I would say is the case? And to what extent is that, was that part of the character of, of the language of the Quran itself? So the, the language of revelation, so to speak. And uh, many scholars think that, you know, there was a kind of, kind of, high culture language which was this kind of weird mixed thing that people used in poetry and also used to compose the quran um and i say well you know there's something that's something we can test that that's a test of hypothesis why the quran is very uh, helpfully written in rhyme so i come at this as a linguist you get this difference between vowels the a and the a vowel which some of the readers have and then other readers do not have that so some readers have more vowels than other readers and we can look at the rhyme because those words show up in rhyme. And what we see is that words that are pronounced with A can only be pronounced with A, which clearly shows that that was a different sound from the A. So you can kind of look at the rhyme and say, okay, we can reconstruct what it sounded like. Now, not every single word sends in rhyme, of course, so we cannot completely know every single aspect of pronunciation, but we can really learn a, a couple of things. And once you start doing that, if you start looking, okay, what shows up in rhyme? How are words actually spelled where people say, well, these are differences between dialects. What we get, and we make this list, is okay. So not looking at what the reading traditions do, because the reading traditions sometimes just break rhyme because of these kinds of things. But what does the text actually tell us? What can they kind of tell us from the spelling? What can it tell us from the rhyme? And if you start doing that, you learn something very nice. Because what you get every single time when there's a place where we could check it in the text, so not on the reading tradition, but purely check it from the text, every single time the linguistic features that we find there are associated with Hejaz. 
uh, and specifically even the, the tribe of the Quraysh, which was the, the tribe of uh, Muhammad, every single time, which suggests to me that the Quran was not written down or even you know uh, revealed in some uh, poetic language. And the Quran even goes out of his way to make this point. It says, look, our revelation is in, in, uh, in uh, Lisan Arabi, that is in the Arabic language, uh, so that you may understand the clear Arabic language. Uh, clearly, and it's even saying, and it's not foreign, clearly making, I, I would say, and this is this isn't a thought not, not by me, but uh, uh, written up by Ahmad Jalad, who said, look, um, it is not saying this text is in a magical poetic language that people use. No, it's saying it is in a vernacular, unlike the Bible, which is in Aramaic or Greek, right? Unlike uh, the Hebrew Bible, which is in Hebrew. Um, this text is actually one you can actually understand. So, you know, when I start speaking this text and tell you about these things, you can hear directly what it means. More interesting, even there's traditions and pretty good traditions uh, of the early compilation of the Uthmanic texts, where a couple of the people are in disagreement with each other how they're supposed to write a certain word. Um, and then they go to Uthman and it's like, okay, what should we be doing? And he says, look, you need to write down the, the, the Quran in the dialect of the Quraysh because that is how it was revealed. If that's true, that's not what people are reciting today. What they're reciting today absolutely is not the dialect of the Quraysh at all. Um, so clearly something changed. The language that the Quran is recited in has indeed been changed to something much closer to like the language of poetry and these kinds of things. But it seems to have originally been composed and written down in the dialect of Quraysh. Well, part of their job to be a good reciter is to use this kind of language and make these kind of choices and do exotic things with the language. And they're really doing that. You can see them play, play around with this. Uh, famous is, for example, Hafsa, the, 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 the most common uh, transmitter of, of uh, the most common reading today. Um, he has a couple of words which he will read the same way every time for like 200 times, except one time where he'll read the word slightly differently, only in pronunciation. But only once, which has absolutely no function except that to just show off. Hey, I know that you can read it like this too. Check it out. I know it, and you know it's part of kind of part of the 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 play of the language, and that's what they're doing. So they're really playing around with this language and trying to make it more beautiful and figuring out how to make it beautiful, um, and really interacting and showing off their prowess in this um, classical Arabic language and what they can do with it and how they understand it, how many how many good details they know. Um, so th that's kind of what's going on with the language. There are meaning differences and every now and then they are reconcilable and sometimes they're not and um i think it's 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 probably reasonable and you should be trying to reconcile them in some way um if, if that's that's a possibility but every now and then um they don't Here we get, you know, Sahrani uh, or Sahrani, which indeed translates to something like two works of magic, two, two magics um, uh, or two pieces of magic uh, supporting each other or two magicians. Uh, so, you know, um, there are two magicians. Well, which one is it? Um, so what, what's kind of interesting about this, uh, I, I suppose, and you get this every now and then with these readings, is it's, it's in direct speech, you know, and if direct speech is supposed to be... Um, transmitting what people, historical people or figures actually said, it's like, okay, which one did they say? 
Uh, and sometimes you get very absurd solutions um, where where modern Muslims try to harmonize. He's like, well, they said both. They just said it both in a row, which is n obviously not what happened. Uh, <laughs> they are different and they mean something differently. And they're technically irreconcilable if you assume that they are both direct transcripts of a real historical event in that sense. There's a famous one, and this with the is is the you know the annunciation that that um, Mary is going to be pregnant and get a child, and uh, the angel comes down and says, you know, uh, I have been sent by the Lord, in order to give you that I give you a pure son, or that He gives you a pure son, which doesn't actually work with the standard text, but some of the readers still read it that way. It's kind of an interesting thing going on there. Is that I give you, uh, He gives you. Is that in order to avoid the suggestion that this angel himself will be impregnating Mary? Um, you know, there, there seems to be some kind of theological motivation there. That one shows up in one very early manuscript, uh, actually has the, so that he may give you a pure son. And uh, this is in the British Library manuscript OR2165, where um, he, yeah, he changed the text and the Rasim is different. So, so, so the consonantal skeleton has actually been fixed by the scribe or fixed towards what he wanted. And so mm. he fixed it that way. And actually the Sana Palim says has the same variant, uh, which is interesting on the lower text. Um, so clearly these two were competing with each other and some people felt, no, no I, I can change this. So you can see how they would avoid a reading like that, but it's both of them are completely canonical. It is after the death of the prophet. Um, right. And uh, so there, 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 there's, let's say, you know, at, at minimum, at least a decade in between his death and when they wrote it down. Now, all kinds of things could have happened in between that time. Um, it is not, there's no voice recording in between. So can we know um, whether whether the text, um, as we have it in the Uthmanic text, is exactly identical to how the prophet said it or, mm -hmm. or reveal, had it revealed, say? Um, I mean, we just can't know. From a historical perspective, we, we just can't prove that. You know, we can't say, well, we know for sure that, uh, that it's exactly as it was intended. No, that doesn't make any sense because these people who are arguing with each other over the contents of the text are both Qurayshi, so they would be speaking the same dialect. So, you know, why would they be disagreeing on this? Um, so that can't be it. Uh, but it's a very popular opinion. You still hear it a lot today, uh, despite it being very obviously wrong. We have some reports, traditional reports, that tell, tell us, look, um, there were other Qurans besides Uthman's Quran. Ibn Mas'ud had, had his own Quran, so these are companions of the Prophet Ubay, Ibn Abbas, etc. And they are said to have had different orders of surahs, sometimes more surahs, sometimes fewer surahs, and sometimes different wordings in certain places. Sometimes words were ordered in a different way. Sometimes you just chose a different word. And there are reports that seem to suggest that, you know, even Masoud's codex was still around um, as late as the ninth century, and people were able to actually look at it and report what it said. Uh, but where are they? For a long time, um, scholars were wondering, um, 
where are they? And they were skeptical, you know, are these reports just made up? What's going on with these? Um, so they've long been skeptical of such codices, but it, if they really existed, where are they? The text below it is a different text type. So it's not the Othmanic text. Every single other manuscript that we have right now, um, which is hundreds of manuscripts, are all of the Othmanic text type. All of them are part of the standard text, which really shows there was a clear standardization effort at some point. Um, except for this one. This is an exception. This manuscript has slightly different wording, um, that, that's really the difference. Um, so the verses are more or less in the same order, but the surah, so that's the chapters, are in different orders than, than we're used to. So that's interesting. That has been, been thrown about. And the wording is a little different. Uh, so every now and then um, you're like, OK, that's not, not exactly how we have it in a standard text. So that's very exciting because now we have one example of what the Quran could have looked like or did look like um, before the standardization. The standardization oh. has erased a lot of that. Um, so we don't have much access to it. And this is one of the rare examples where we can get access to it. I don't think this this uh, folios this uh, parchment was meant to be to lead to a final copy or right. yes it, it process in something in between or uh, a support of uh, uh, writing down in a very specific milieu of milieu of uh, teaching and learning uh, the text. Thank you for that clarification. That's important. So you're um, thinking that this was a page that was never intended to be uh, included in a Quran manuscript uh, yeah. and to a bound, a bound Quran. It was rather an exercise in writing down what an instructor was uh, was teaching. Yes. So what we can say about it is that the text is not a descendant of the Uthmanic text. It's not, uh, you know, we had the standard text and someone was just being a very terrible scribe. No. This is really a separate tradition, and those two separate traditions go back to an older tradition together. Um, and that older must have also been in written form. So there was some kind of kind of text from from which these these have descended, and uh, this text is is just a variant of 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 a earlier text. The lower text of the Sun and Palimpsest, which is 
really very similar to the kinds of variants that get reported for um, for the companions. So Ibn Masoud mm -hmm. is, is one of the important companions here. Uh, he had his own codex, had differences in, in Surah order, basically, and had exactly these kinds of variants. So some of the variants even that we find in Sun of are ones that are reported to exist for companions. canonical reciters onwards yeah probably uh you could say you know the canonical reciters are extremely widespread nobody is disagreeing and there's some small disagreements here and there on tiny words but the essential point here is that's up to the reciters and then going back to the prophet it's actually not an all that super widespread thing at all uh some readings are only read by a single reciter um and if that is a single so so one one specific word is so well if you take the whole system right only one reciter recites that way and then spread it and we cannot trace that back the chain back from that person all the way back to the prophet that's just a straight chain who knows maybe they made it up maybe it's real In the early early periods, everybody's like, okay, it's very important that, that you have a good chain of transmission back to the prophets, of course, right? And you have to say how you got this recitation, why, etc. But you don't get it for every single word. Like, okay, I learned this word from this person, that word from that person. We just don't have that kind of detail. Mm -hmm. Just know who were the teachers, these kind of things. So in the beginning, I say it's very important to have a good chain of transmission, but nobody said this is tawatur, this this, this has mutawatur, you know, this has tawatur or it is mutawatur. Um they just said, good transmission, there we go. And at some point, this, this, this idea develops, no, 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 it's not just good transmission, it's the best possible transmission, right? There's no doubt how good this transmission is. Um, and that has become more or less the orthodoxy these days. It's not something that was, went completely unchallenged. So famously, uh, Ibn al-Jazari, who is um, a, let me say this right, 14th century scholar, um, so our, our, our accounts, a 14th century scholar, right. um, who canonized uh, the three readings after the canonical seven, and his 10 readings are today considered, you know, impeccable and mutawatir. But he himself says in his book, I don't think they are, which is a very interesting thing that people find all kinds of interesting ways <laughs> to, to read that text in, in a way that words just stop having any meaning at all. Um, but he doesn't believe um that is, it's a case he says and he clearly thinks that most of most of the recitation is but he says you know for every single word we cannot make for every single reading that's possible we cannot say for every single one of them they're absolutely uh multiple.
Tabari uh, that we're talking about is one of the great early exegetes. He lives in the end of the third Islamic century and um, he wrote a big exegesis and also a big history and he wrote a lot of things and he was brilliant, uh, but he wrote an exegesis of the Quran and he talks about the different variant readings and he'll evaluate them. He says, well, some people read this, some people read that and I think this is better um, or both of them are fine. And sometimes he says, this is garbage. You can't do this. You can't recite it like this. And some of those are canonical readings today. Of course, when he's writing, they're not, right? There is no right. canon of the canonical readers until, well, actually his lifetime. Um, so <laughs> he dies a bit before Ibn Mujahid, but they were both in Baghdad. And, um, and they knew each other, uh, probably, uh, but they're, they're contemporaneous. And then Ibn Mujahid canonizes it. And after that, it becomes... Well, at least even after that, people still reject readings every now and then. They're like, no, I think this is better. Even Ibn Mujahid himself, so the, the guy who canonized the seven readings in his book that became the canon of the seven readings, there's a couple of times where he says, no, I think this is wrong. Um, he's, he's wrong about this. And even so, he, he's, he's, um, he's a, a student of one of the transmitters of the Ibn Kathir. He said, no, I, I think my teacher is wrong here. This can't be right. The end. Right? So that, that, that's it. Um, so it's really interesting. And that, that totally shifts uh, at some point to the point that right now it's, these readings are totally unassailable. They were. They were perfectly assailable. They were even assailable to the person who canonized themselves. We can't say, well, his teacher recited exactly like that too. No, no, we can see very clearly that teacher students have slightly different readings. So they make word choices. And some of these word choices are very widely attested. And, you know, like seven of the 10 readers read it in one way and three in the other. And the seven, okay, that's maybe super widespread. You could say that has tawatur, it's mutawatur. Um, but others are read by only one uh, and only one one reader. There's, there's no way you can say, well, this is mutawatur because it's only one person who spread it. And, you know, he's 100 years at, uh, after the fact, at the least. Some of the canonical readers that we know are students of other canonical readers. And so we can see that Hamza, who is the Kufan, uh, one of the Kufan reciters, his student was al Kisai, who is one of the other Kufan reciters. And those two readings are very similar. And obviously, because you know, they were in teacher-student relationship with each other. So that makes sense, right? They they, they realize, um, so they made some changes. They, they don't have the exact same recitation, but they are clearly transmitting from each other and have learned from each other. So we can confirm that chain, so to speak, because we have both their reading. That transmission is quite good. So we can say al Kitsai certainly learned from, from uh, Hamza. Hamza certainly learned from Al-Amash. And Al-Amash learned from... I think a Sulemi, if I'm getting this right, and then uh, Ibn Mas'ud, who was one of the um, uh, 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 one of the companions of the Prophet and, uh, and a prominent one. Um, and that chain, I think we can confirm basically every step of the way and have a pretty good sense. Okay, now that this really seems to be true. With other ones, so uh, a particularly problematic one is uh, Ibn Amir. Ibn Amir is a Syrian reciter, and we have two transmissions from him. Um, and they both converge not on Ibn Amir, but his first student. So there's only one student from him, and from him, everything else uh, diverges. So we have absolutely no way that, to know that even Ibn Amir's reading is the one uh, that, that we have today, because basically we have the reading of his student. And mm. we say it's Ibn Amir's reading, because the student said it's Ibn Amir's reading. This is how I learned it. Um, so do we know for sure? No, it doesn't, doesn't take away the possibility that they added in some new readings or new interpretations of a text where they did not necessarily have an example from their teacher.
according to the tradition, Ibn Amr lived to be 108 years old, if I'm getting this right, but at least way over 100, which is very, very old. Like it could have happened, but, yeah. um, but it seems to perhaps be there to occasion the possibility for him to have actually learned the reading from Afman directly, which is probably not the case. Um, and so there's, there, there's some problems with that one. Um, and there's some other chains as well, which look a bit more realistic, but he would still have to have been really, really quite old. Um, so, you know, what's going on with that? Who knows? Um, and yeah, we don't know. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know where he got his reading from. And we were there's good reason to kind of doubt he got it the way he got it. And with many other ones, it's like, well, there's nothing that looks particularly problematic and it might even be true, but there's no way to be sure. Uh, there are some, say, hacks in the system to allow um, certain things to work out and people would sometimes just completely make up uh, chains of transmission. Uh, those happen and you can see them and you can kind of work out the networking. It's like all of a sudden there's like all these made up names and we have no idea who these are and that's obviously made up. Uh, but very often the tradition recognizes that themselves as well. Hisham bin Ammar, he is the, the canonical rawi of the, of the Dimashq reading, of the Syrian reading. Um, it says that when he got older, he became senile. And he started to read and recite anything that was given to him. He would repeat and transmit anything people told him without inquiring about its truth. But he was more trustworthy when he was younger. Okay. Now, Hisham transmitted 400 fabricated hadiths. In Arabic, لَيْسَ uh, With all apparently good isnads. A man by the name of Fadlak, his name Fadlak al-Razi probably, used to give these fabricated hadiths to Hisham, who did transmit them, and due to which he almost created a rupture in Islam. Hisham was dictating hadith one day when he was asked, who gave you this hadith? He answered, one of my teachers. When he was asked again, he yawned, closed his eyes, and from, from sleepiness, and Muhammad bin Muslim al-Razi said, I decided to stop narrating hadith of Hisham because he used to sell hadith. Um, Ahmad bin Hanbal, the famous uh, jurist, uh, said Hisham was fickle and frivolous. frivolous. Uh, one day he was sitting in public while his private parts were visible. A man told him, cover yourself. Hisham responded, have you seen it? Uh, God willing, you will never go blind in your life. So he had a sense of humor. Ibn Hanbal said, one must repeat the prayer if it was led by Hisham. We have these kind of derogatory comments in the biographies of the, what we call the canonical readers. And again, the question is, uh, why Muslims uh, still thought it was okay to transmit the Quran, which is the most important document, of course, in Islam, uh, why they still trusted Hisham? Hafsa Nasim, the, um, the standard and canonical, again, version of most Muslims today. Um, it says that Ahmad bin Hanbal uh, said that the, uh, this, his hadith, the hadith of Hafs, was not to be transmitted. Ibn Ma'in stated that he was not trustworthy, while Al-Madini, those are all hadith critics, said that his hadith was weak and should be abandoned. Al-Bukhari said the hadith transmitters abandoned Hafs' hadith, Tarakuhu, and an Nasa'i confirmed that his hadith must neither be learned nor written down. Other critics said that all his hadith were manakir and bawatir in Arabic. They were all fabricated and they were all forged. Um, not only was he untrustworthy in hadith, but it was reported that his colleague Shu'ba was more reliable than him in Quran. Um, and then we have uh, some reported that Hafs was a better reciter than Shu'ba, but he was a liar, kathab. Um, and this is Hafs. So this is how Hafs is, you know, was depicted in biographical information. Same with Asim. I will not also read that, but the, uh, I have a very beautiful quotation here from, some, from someone who said, anyone whose name was Asim had bad memory. So if your name is Asim, it means you just like you can't memorize things. And again, this is the uh, most important canonical um, uh, rawi uh, 
i.e. transmitter of, um, of the Quran. I can come up with lots of arguments about the Quran that would make me think this is not from God. Direct contradictions. Provable fabrications. Provable changes. Allah says this in the Quran. Had this come from anyone other than your Lord, surely you would have found in it much contradiction, much conflict, many problems. 